window, and <clears throat> hopefully I'll be able to <clears throat> upload. See, I told you, somebody told me it was 1.30. I even my PowerPoint. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start a little bit about me and is teaching this workshop. So I started off as an industrial physicist when I was in graduate school. Right? I used to always, professors talked like one day we, we would all be academics, and what I wanted to be was an industrial physicist. So this is me. I worked for a company, seven years, seven bosses, three owners, and four different names. I'm the only person standing everybody else kneeling or sitting. Right. And that thing in the middle is an extruded sodium iodide thallium crystal. Short answer, it's dope salt and it's a radiation detector. These were four inch by four inch by 40 and we used them to look for, well not us, we sold them to the Japanese and they used them to look for double beta decays which are sign of neutrinos in caves in Japan. Right? <clears throat> and here I am on the other side. This is from the Q conference that, that was in Akron two years ago. And, you know, me as, as an academic at the University of Akron, and I don't want to bore you with all of my glory white elephant. Deep, but basically, I teach physics in um, a, a college called Summit College. I teach primarily the first two semesters physics, so the first year of physics. I also teach um, some software classes and a computer programming class. I'm also a professor of education in the College of Education. I've taught math education. Um, I'm teaching educational technology this semester. And I taught an intro to Q methodology course a number of times this summer, the most recent, where it was 100% online, and I surprised myself by actually liking online teaching. So, <clears throat> and I do university STEM initiatives, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, and I'm helping develop a new high school that just opened last week, so, right, if I seem a little frazzled, this is the second week of the semester, the second week of the new STEM high school, and, you know, it's been nonstop. So, I have loved Q methodology since 2004. Um, that is when, just by chance, I ran into a friend at a conference that I had taken some classes with in graduate school. He introduced me to the idea of Q methodology, and then literally that that semester, or well, that was the spring semester, spring 2004, and then fall 2004, I did my first Q study, got it published in 2005, and since then I have 17 referee Q. Uh, journal articles, a book chapter about Q as a mixed method. I've been president of the society and a conference host, and now I'm the advisor. <clears throat> I'm on editorial boards, and I've presented in Steve Brown's Q graduate Q class at Kent State. So lots of, I live the life of Q, I guess. <clears throat> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about what I plan to do today. We'll do an overview. We'll touch on some vocabulary. You guys will be sorting items into grids. My half happy cutters have cut up some more pieces of paper, and you know we might end up. I have scissors. Sorry, two of them are children. Um, so you might have to cut your own. I'd say if you've done a Q sort before, Q sort, or they've only done it one time, please let them do the Q sort. Because I always find it almost impossible to explain the sorting process to someone who hasn't experienced it. So if I make even even when I went to uh, we have a like a symposium for our graduate students and I was a guest lecturer and, and I made them sort through. And they liked it, right? Because I love the sorting a couple of people who were in that are in there. Um, <coughs> So then we'll talk a little bit more about sorting items into the grid, the concourse of items in the Q sample, the P set, all those things. And then we'll talk a little bit about analyzing the Q sorts, hopefully 
setting it up very well for, for Charlie and Diane's right workshop that starts after this one. So, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about why groups of people and give some examples of Q-Study printouts and, and other things like that. So, okay, everybody should have a clicker. Hopefully we had enough, right? <clears throat> Pretty much you're going to answer A, B, C, or D. It's very simple. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, your, ex your experience with Q, right? It's an anonymous mode. that just means that, right, I don't know who has what clicker. <clears throat> it makes my ed tech students feel much more comfortable because they can tell me that they didn't do their project that was due today at 11 o'clock. And, and I won't know who it is. Makes me happy. So, so I'll say Q methodology researcher. I have done some Q methodology research, but I don't consider myself a Q researcher. I am familiar with Q research, like the literature, but have not acted as a Q researcher yet. I have done one or more Q source, but I'm not really familiar. And, or I am a complete novice, right? Which might mean that you've never even done Q before. Everybody clicked in already? See how we are. So 45% of you have done some Q research, but you don't consider yourself a Q researcher. Right? 25% of you are going to be bored during my presentation. Sorry. And, and then we have a looks like probably doing quick math and complete novice and somebody who's done one or more Q source but hasn't done a Q study. <clears throat> so a little bit of an introduction to Q, kind of a general overview, right? So why do we use Q? Mostly because we're interested in the perspectives or views of some group of people. They could sort one time, like the Q sort I have you doing, right? We could have them sort, right, multiple conditions. We could have one person sort multi epistemology, how they view basically knowledge and learning, and then we wanted to look at their views relative to their instructor's views of their views. Right? So the students sorted, and then the instructors sorted once for how they thought their students would sort, and then once for what their ideal student would sort. And it was very interesting. You know, it's one of my, sorry, never published papers, but it was interesting because it gave a lot of insight to the instructors who participated about how they viewed their students. So <clears throat> anyway, so basically the process involves right, selecting a Q sample from a concourse. Right? The concourse is the general communicability on the topic. And the Q sample is what we sort. Right? Then the participants sort items usually into a normal or quasi-normal distribution, which is that grid. And then we factor analyze the sorts so that we get correlations of sorts, so groups of people opposed to our factor analysis where we group items. And typically I would say that it's fair to say that we kind of tend to treat the software as a big black box that does the factor analysis for us. But we shouldn't be afraid of factor analysis, just correlation. It's not scary. So a little We'll see how we do here for our, our vocabulary, right? So the items that are sorted by participants, right, is called the blank, right? <coughs> oh, sorry, I put without answer because it's left over from an old thing when I had different clickers. Right? And so is it the P-set, the concourse, the Q-sample, or none of these? So the items sorted by participants. Yeah, I know I just told you before, but this is how I test if my students are paying attention or, you know, they're texting their boyfriend or checking out what their sister's doing on Facebook or any other assortment of things if possible. All right, are we ready? Yay, 71% of you were paying attention. So it's the Q sample. Sometimes I know with graduate students we have problems with some of these words. The P set are the people who do the sorting. The concourse is right a larger set of items that we select the Q sample from. Right. <clears throat> Oops, we didn't have to do that one. All right, the Q sample, what is sorted, can consist of what? Statements, 
sense or smells, pictures, sounds. Yay, it is all of those. Yeah, we're used to statements, but they can be any assortment of things. I remember, I think it was the second Q conference I went to, Dennis Kinfleet did one on music, right? That's how he did them. So, participants sorted musical sounds, and that was his Q study. Just thought it was really cool. <laughs> all right, next question. Guys are doing awesome. Right, which is an appropriate item for a Q sample? It is the sunshine makes me feel happy, both A and B, or neither A and B. Or B. We don't want to be like my, my daughter who's in eighth grade who thought it was really funny because her teacher asked some question and it was, you know, it was A was something, B was something, and C was none of these and D was all of these and she just you know, thought it was really funny because it couldn't be none of these and all of these. It didn't make any sense. But yeah, she's a clever one. All right, very good. So it's not, it is sunny because that's, right, that's a statement of truth, right? We can look outside and say, oh my God, it is sunny in Pittsburgh. Um, but right, sunshine makes me feel happy is a subjective idea, right? Somebody can't do a test, really, right? Just to, to look out the window and see that it's making you happy. <clears throat> so how a Q study starts, right? It really starts with a research purpose, maybe research questions. Right? One of my favorite things, it's a paper by Isidore Newman and Keith McNeil, I think, which is that it's a typology of research purposes. So it's the purpose of the research that allows us to select the appropriate methodology, right? So we assume that we've selected a purpose, right? We want to know people's, here, I'll do a shameless plug from my paper tomorrow. We want to know, right, a group of stakeholders' views about the creation of a new STEM academy, right, that would look at, right, preschool through graduate school teaching of STEM. Right, science, technology, and that might be the purpose. We say, oh, we want to know people's varying views. Well, that's only a Q study, of course. Right? And then we want to decide where we're going to get the statements related to this purpose. So maybe we want to interview some of the stakeholders. Right? Maybe we have a lot of communications on the topic. Maybe there's been a lot of emails. There's been some meetings with some meeting minutes taken. Right? focus group, we can get statements a lot of different ways. Right? When we collect all, we might have an awful lot of statements. We might have, right, like for the STEM Academy, I think I had like 120 statements. Nobody wants to sort 120 statements. Right? And so now we need to select a sample that represents those communications. So right, usually what I do is I, I do everything in a in an Excel sheet. In fact, I could show you what it looks like, I think. Oh, hopefully I have one up here that's, you know, oh, look, it's, it, oh, here's the STEM Academy study. <clears throat> so there's my sorting grid. Right? <clears throat> so 88 statements, right? Then I filtered them. I went through them all, right? <clears throat> Um, seeing which ones might be similar. I, I like to write things down, but paper is my enemy because I have lots of it already in my office to make finding things like a, you know, like a treasure hunt. <laughs> so <clears throat> I usually do things electronically. <clears throat> and so I go through and, and look at all of these kinds of things, right? <clears throat> and then I start honing them down, right? <clears throat> I had a set and then I, I so here I categorize them, right? So I wrote all the numbers down into these different categories of whether they were institution, right? They were related to the institution, the university, if they were related to faculty or success or partnerships. So I find for me that's a really great way to work on selecting my Q sample. <clears throat> then 
Now we have our Q sample. We have a great number of statements. And we'll talk about the number of statements. Of those, okay? Students are participants. Sorry, all my, almost all of my participants. Think based on a condition of instruction, right? No, it's not your one. That was a third. Right, then sorts are entered into the specialized software. I would say that most of us use EQ method, right? And it's a wonderful DOS program, right? We still love it. It's DOS. It's like factor analysis. DOS is not scary, right? It's just not pretty, right? It doesn't have nice graphics. It was before we knew things. Those of us who remember things like WordStar, when we had computers with keyboards and have arrows. And CR stood for carriage return. It was like the big baffling thing for my online Q workshop this summer. Because at one point there's instructions and it says hit CR. And students were like, what? I was like, oh, carriage return. And they looked at me blankly. I was like, oh, you're not old enough to remember carriage returns. It's the enter key. <laughs> so then we group people. It's that scary factor analysis mumbo jumbo, right? It just means correlation. So they're correlated into similar views, also known as factors, right? And then the researcher uses those results, right, the very detailed and somewhat long printout, right, to look at and examine and describe the views that exist within the group. Oh, look, we have more, more sorting for those of you who want to sort. Thank you. So why does Q methodology make more sense than a different sort of? Well, you know, I like to tell them a story, <laughs> right? So, and, and this story is the story of my now former department chair. 